I now look to Chen Kaizhe, Secretary, to continue to open the case for the opposition. Thank you, Mr. President. Despite our political differences in many different ways, I have thoroughly enjoyed working with you over the vacation to put together this historic debate. And I commend you for your courage to stick in with this traditional debate when some members in the House of Commons are even refusing to have a discussion. In a time when political debate is so divisive and vitriolic, I just want to thank the other side for the civil and rational discourse we're having tonight. This is also what I believe the Oxford Union has always been all about since it was funded in 1823. I thereby thank you all, guests and the audience tonight for the opportunity and for your participation. Make no mistake here, this is a momentous and potentially precarious time for our country. Standing in this chamber, the very chamber that has prepared Gladstone, Macmillan, Heath to take office in number 10 Downing Street. No, we can add another name to the list. The former president of this very debating society, the focus of our debate tonight, our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Yet it falls upon us to recognize this is not a debate about Boris the man, or Boris the Prime Minister you might disagree with. Not this is a debate on whether we should have voted to leave in 2016 or what we think Theresa May or David Cameron's government is. This is a debate about Boris Johnson and his administration and its past, present, and future. There are three questions I want you to ask in listening to my speech tonight. First, on issues ranging from education to healthcare, from transportation to trade, does our current government deserve the fair coverage and the credit where credit is due? Or the monolithic demonization some might embrace? Secondly, on the question of Brexit, whether any government at this critical juncture, and given the constraint confronting our decision making, would fare better or worse than the party that commands the majority of the electorate in this country? Is alternative, a coalition of genuine chaos led by Jeremy Corbyn is going to do any better? Are we making the perfect enemy for the good? Finally, on what this country really should be about. Should it be a country built up on segmented and segregated identity and categories, or a unifying nation that embraces its diversity, its equity, tackling head on the adverse circumstances that lie ahead of us. Treat this as a vote of confidence. A vote of confidence on what you think this country should be. It falls on the burden of the proposition tonight to prove to us as how to the Labour Party, the utterly divided Labour Party, fail to deliver its constitutional duty to provide the alternative could be the future of this country. Or indeed, how the idealistic but yet deeply unrealistic, liberal democratic second referendum, like the sweet union track of throwing another referendum if you don't get the same vote, is going to play out. Before I start to tell you all the exciting reasons you should have confidence in Her Majesty's government, it is my privilege to introduce the proposition speakers before the House tonight. You have just heard from Beatrice Spar, St. Peter's College, the treasurer elect of the Oxford Union. Although we have worked together over the vacation, and I still struggle to define her political identity. <laughs> Maybe she has truly mastered the art of the union politics in order to take the high office. You've got to conceal your political colors. Go for it, uh, if so, I am sure I agree uh, with Barry here. Uh, she will go on to achieve great things in this place. Not only can she make herself at ease among blue, orange, and red, but for anyone who has seen her on the dance floor of plush, she can be equally flirtatious among all colors of the rainbow.
The second speaker is the Shadow Secretary of State for International Trade, Barry Gardiner, Member of Parliament for Britain North. Despite having studied at the other place, I am not going to hold him accountable for it tonight because there are far more pressing issues he needs to answer tonight. <laughs> having been through his campaign literature, I wonder what has happened to his pledge to respect the referendum vote for independence from the European Union. Making the closing statement for the proposition is third-year historian Joseph Graham Bradley, Christchurch, elected member of the Standing Committee here at the Union. For someone who opposes Slate, he sure is on the wrong one for tonight. <laughs> Coming from a liberal bubble, Mr. President, those are your guests, and they are most welcome. <laughs> Coming from a liberal bubble like Oxford, it is easy that you can think the complicated question of politics can easily be broken down into one dominating word, Brexit. That is be all and end all. But when you speak to the homeless person in London, rough sleeping because of housing crisis in this country, the workers in Newcastle who struggle to make the ends meet, or the single mother in Cardiff who worried about providing the best for her children. Denied. I'm sure what is on their mind <laughs> is not Brexit. It is about their livelihood, the economy, the opportunities, the immediate factors with the imminent influences on these individuals. And believe it or not, Brexit can wait. That is what I'm going to talk about first tonight. This conservative government rewards hard work. That's why we are going to increase the national living wage to £10.50 per hour <coughs> within the next five years. A few more quid per hour could mean putting on a better meal for your family at the dining table. At the same time, young workers shouldn't be taken advantage of simply because of their age. That's why we are going to lower their age from 25 to 21 for the threshold giving the next generation of go-getters a head start in life. The same head start in life should be equaled, equally extended to all the young people in this country. That's why we're investing extra 14 billion pounds in schools across the country, giving every secondary school pupil a minimum 5,000 pound funding boost to help them to succeed in life. We not only want people to succeed. This conservative government cares for its elderly and the vulnerable in the society. That's why we are committed to a 33 billion a year annual increase in the cash funding to the day-to-day -day running of the NHS. And an additional 13 billion pounds in the next decade to construct new general hospitals. While this conservative government is delivering on people's priorities, the Jeremy Corbyn-led Labour Party is still indulging itself in the socialist experiments. They want a four-day working week, which would slash wages for people in the lower income bracket. They want to ban private schools, which cost the taxpayers billions of pounds and shutting the doors for all the international students. Banning symptoms of privilege does nothing to attack the core root of inequality. They want to get, off, they want to get rid of Ofsted which would lose the safeguard of our educational standards. Is that the government you want them to lead the country? Now you may think, I'm running away from the elephant in the room. Let's get onto it. Let's talk about Brexit. <laughs> our Prime Minister has made it to his personal mission to take us out of the European Union on October the 31st. Since this government was formed 86 days ago, ministers have been working tirelessly to find a deal while leveling up funding for no deal preparation. Because this government understands, like in any negotiation, you have to be able to walk away to get a good deal. If you read some of the recent news headlines, you may think, wow, Chiang Kai, how are you going to win the debate tonight? 
but I refer you to the most recent news item on your phone. 10.42 this morning, when Boris Johnson has secured a deal with the European Union to get us out of this mess, you will realize that the obstacles and the difficulties facing us today are just as likely to apply to any other party leading the country at the moment in any counterfactual. The Irish question is not going to go away. The European partners are not magically going to become sins or demons. Britain's political relationship with the Allies will remain to be complicated. Let's not fault individual when the system is at fault. And indeed, what would and what did the Labour Party say to these challenges? They supported the Ban Act to take no deal off the table, forcing the Prime Minister to request a further extension. They allowed their members of the European Parliament to write to the European Union, begging them to give us not a deal, nothing but extension. They advocated for a second referendum, pretending the first one has never happened, pretending the liberal echo chamber of comfortable, privileged individuals can represent the rest of the country. And finally, when Labour members of parliament are ready to go back to the Super Saturday sitting to vote for the deal, their unscrupulous boss, Jeremy. Jeremy said, if you vote for the deal, you can never stand for parliament again. What absolute nonsense. <laughs> Labour doesn't want Brexit. They don't want to cancel Brexit. They want to see this conservative government suffering from Brexit. And through that, they drag all of us into the quagmire. I come from Lancashire. And I can tell you, all 14 districts in Lancashire voted to leave. Mm. I can tell you that democracy dies when the wealthy elite decided they know better than the millions who voted and made their voice heard, like it or not, in 2016. Go on, then. Is that why the Vote Leave campaign was associated with hundreds of thousands of pounds of electoral fraud? <laughs> The judiciary system is dealing with this, but we as a government are focusing, are focusing on deliver the results of the referendum. And as for you, sir, the president-elect of the Liberal Democrats, as for the Liberal Democrats, I have much admiration for them, but little time for dreaming when we, our country, need our saving. Ladies and gentlemen, it is in this conservative government you must have confidence in, because it is by far better than all of its alternatives. Mm. In Chinese, the word crisis, wei ji, contains two symbols. One stands for danger, and the other for opportunity. Mm. In a crisis, be aware of the danger, but recognize and embrace the opportunity. When we inevitably deliver Brexit, the conservative government inevitably deliver Brexit, who would you trust the most? to embrace the opportunities. This conservative government is eager to trade as an independent nation with our existing European Union partners, with the Commonwealth, the BRIC countries, and all nations across the world. This conservative government is determined to take back control of our fishing waters, giving back the livelihood to our coastal communities. People you don't see very often here in Oxford or Cambridge because they are shut off from the chamber like this one. But the thing most close to my heart, as an immigrant myself, it is this government can finally take back control of its borders and come up with a liberal immigration system. The government has already revived the post-study working <coughs> visa, making it easier for international students to stay and contribute to the economy after they finish their studies. With this liberal immigration system, Applicants from Canada, India, China will no longer be discriminated against by the numbers cap. Indeed, we can welcome the software engineer from New Delhi, the computer science from China, the doctor from Bangkok, or indeed, people like me and my parents. To finish my remark, I want to end my speech on a rather personal note. I was born on the east coast of China. I have never thought I would have the opportunity to speak in the Oxford Union, let alone in the no confidence debate. 
At the very end of the day, I want to be known and remembered not by where I'm from, but for who I am, a British citizen. And I think the Conservative Party stands for a Britain that we can all coexist as one nation, one nation of different ethnicities, different sexualities, and different political viewpoints, as opposed to a society preyed apart by mechanically imposed labels, identities, and categories. Brexit will indubitably happy happen and affect our country for the next five to 10 years. But how we vote tonight, how we vote in this country today about the Her Majesty's government will determine how we reflect on ourselves over the many decades to come in this island nation's long history. Do we want to remember 2019's Britain as a country that claims to be cosmopolitan, believes shackled in fears, or a country that embraces globalism, taking one step out of its comfort zone and many steps forward in its political progress. I believe, as many among my Chinese diaspora, among my fellow conservatives, and among friends and members sitting in the chamber tonight, that we face, when we face adversity, the solution is not to run away from adversity, only to run into more adversities down the road, but to tackle them head on and say we are worth it, we can do it, and we are better than fear. Vote no tonight. Please your confidence in this conservative government. Thank you.